we're going to be talking today. I was reading, you know, the way I always, pretty much always come up with my sermon, it's just through my daily reading, and I'll come across something that just strikes me, and I start studying it out, and before I know it, there's a sermon right there. And so this one happens to be Exodus 32. We're going to go through that chapter, more or less the whole thing, and for those of you who don't know Exodus 32, it's the golden calf chapter. So it's really exciting. And uh, I called it restrain or refrain. You'll see why later. It's kind of a weird, it just rhymed. You know, I like that. But really this is what I found as I was studying, that really there is a lot of leadership qualities that really, uh, that I was able to pull out of this. And I, um, you might be thinking like, well, why are you doing a message on leadership? Most of us here aren't leaders. But, you know, maybe, maybe you think of a leader as like a pastor or an elder or something like that. But really, I think of a leader as every Christian. Every Christian at some level is a leader. You may not be leading a church. You may not be leading a small group or youth group or anything like that. You may, you, maybe you're leading your home. Maybe you're a parent and you're leading your home. Uh, maybe maybe you're, just, you're just a believer. And there's other, other unbelievers or new believers that don't know as much as you. You're a leader to them, or you should be. So, in in a sense, the quality of leadership applies to all of us, every single one of us. And so, you know, as I go through this, think about your leadership, your places of influence. Wherever you have influence, that is where you're a leader. And apply yourself into these verses. You know, not everyone's going to have the pastor, the pastor side of this. But all of us have some idea of leadership. So we're going to go through it. Verse by verse, Exodus 32. And I'm just going to read uh, the first six verses, and then we'll start kind of exposit, exposit, getting, going through that. <laughs> Expositing it. Exposing it. Is that the word? Ex- expositizing. We're going to do that. <laughs> Exodus 32, 1 through 6. So when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain... Because Moses, he had been up there for 40 days. The people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf. And they said, what is that noise? Okay, that was weird. And they said, there it is, you hear it? It's like a hi-hat, it's weird. Oh, okay, that's fine, sorry, I I, I didn't mean to. Um, And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So the first example that I I really was pulling out of this, of, of an example of leadership, was Moses. Obviously, Moses was the leader of Israel. Up to this point, he had done quite a bit of leading. He led them out of Egypt. You know, after all the ten plagues that happened in Egypt, he was able to lead uh, Israel out of Egypt. Through the Red Sea, they crossed on dry land, led them into the wilderness, where, you know, they were led, essentially, I mean, they were led by Moses, but they were led, ultimately, by God. And so, we get to this point, Quite a bit had happened, and people were used to Moses being the leader. But obviously Moses hadn't been there for a little while. He was up on the mountaintop. And so in verse 1 we we read, I'll just read it once again, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. See, what they saw that he had delayed. They acted as though they thought Moses would never return. Isn't that kind of funny? He wasn't gone for that long. But they almost got in their minds, he's, ne- oh, he's not coming back. That guy, he, he, he's long gone. He forgot about us. You know, Peter dealt with the same kind of thing in the New Testament with people um, when, when it came to, to the message of Christ. Uh, it says in 2 Peter, does it say 2 Peter on the verse? The next 2 Peter verse. 
Yeah. Uh, in 2 Peter 3.8, it says, but do not overlook this one fact. So this is really talking about the second coming of our Lord, right? Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow. See that? He's not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that each should re reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will be like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and its works that are done in it will be exposed. You know, I love this verse. I, I, I think about it all the time, because I, I love the thought of the second coming of the Lord. It's just a great thought to me. And, and I, I can kind of relate with these people who think, is it ever going to happen? You know, because I've been waiting my whole life and I haven't, haven't seen it yet. I do believe it's going to happen. I was, a couple weeks ago, I was at some fireworks. Did anyone go to the Carnation fireworks? Yeah, me neither. Um, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> yeah, so I was at the Carnation fireworks. And, you know, I realized something is I don't think I really like fireworks all that much. Um, I liked, like, the last minute of fireworks. Um, and, and the whole time, I'm waiting for that last, like, the grand finale thing. I'm waiting for, I like the, the you know, the chest-thumping ones. But, like, the whole time, there's, like, 40 minutes of other fireworks. They're just kind of like, whoop, And I'm just like, okay, I get it. We've been doing this for a while. When's the grand finale, right? And, and every time, I don't know why, but every time, I always like, are they really going to... Are they really going to have a grand finale this time? Like, is it actually going to happen this time? That's, that's, what, that's what these people were thinking with Jesus. That's what the children of Israel were thinking with, the golden, uh, with, um, with Moses coming down from Mount. He's not coming back. It's been a while. He's not coming. Um, so, so what I really pull out of that is, um, you know, what did I pull out of that? Let's move on to verse um, to the next part of the verse one. And he said, "The people gathered themselves to Aaron and said to him, "Up, make us gods who shall go before us." Okay. So the people come to Aaron. So Aaron's, you know, he's n never like announced as the leader, but he's de facto kind of the leader. You know, when Moses leaves, he's in charge, right? So everyone comes to Aaron, and uh, and. Aaron's been with Moses. That's the thing. Aaron's been with Moses the whole time, ever since Egypt. He saw all the same wonderful things that happened to Israel. He knows everything. He knows the same history as, as Moses. But one thing he didn't have, he didn't have the vision that Moses had. When the people came to Aaron with a different vision than what, had, you know, than what Aaron knew, he didn't really know what to do because he didn't have a vision of his own. Up to this point, he had just kind of followed Moses' lead. He didn't actually have a vision. And so it brings me to my first good quality of, a, of leadership that I, I pulled out of this, is vision, right? Moses did have vision. We read in Proverbs 29, 18, this is a really good verse, where there is, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. And it's like, it's, I, I, when I read that, it's kind, of, it's kind of confusing how it's worded because we don't really talk like that. But I, I just like, think about what does it mean to cast off restraint? I think about it like, okay, I'm in handcuffs, okay? I'm, I'm handcuffed, I'm restrained. And I cast them off. I'm like, no more of this. I cast off the restraint. So these people, when they were under the leadership of Moses, they were restrained. They were restrained from doing these evil things. And all of a sudden, Moses leaves and they cast off restraint. We see that. And they go to Aaron, they say, up, make us gods, right? Moses was an example of a, of a restraint to the children of Israel. He was their tether that kept them grounded to God's vision and the vision of the Lord. You know, when, when you're a kid, if you're at, like, your parents' house, or, I'm sorry, if you're at, like, your friend's house and their, their parents were in the room, did you act like different when their parents were in the room than when their parents were out of the room? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> but you get the point. It's like 
when Moses is there, they're all, they're all, you know, relatively behaved. As soon as Moses leaves, oh, Aaron, that softy. I'm sure we'll get him to bend. Let's go, let's go talk him into something. In the places we lead, so whether it's church, I, I have three written. There's probably more. Fill in the blank. Wherever you lead, church, work, family, we can be a restrainer of, of sorts. Kind of like Moses. We can, we can kind of make the ground rules for what's acceptable. And that's good. I was thinking about restraint in my family. You know, like, without restraint, my children would probably, like, live on top of my garage roof. <laughs> the reason I say that is because every time... I let them up on the garage roof one time. Years, <laughs> and every time we go outside, they're like, can we get up on the roof? I'm like, no, 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 no. Can't get up on the roof. I let them every once in a while, but they would live up there. They'd put sleeping bags and stay up there all the time. You know, without restraint, my wife would fill every closet in the house with her clothing. <laughs> and I would have no room for my stuff or the kids' stuff. You know, so that's restraint. No. I'm kidding, Christy. I have to pick on you. So we move on to the last part of verse 1 there. And it says, when they said, up, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. You know, it kind of reminds me of the attitude of the apostles when Jesus died. Maybe not as brash, obviously. I'm not saying that the apostles were evil, but you remember like the stories of the apostles when, when Jesus died, and it was kind of like they were just lost. They didn't know what to do. They were just kind of wandering around like, man, that was exciting, but now, now what do I do? I just got to go back to fishing? This is boring. Like, I don't, you know, they, they had no, they were aimless. They had no vision anymore. And uh, we even read Jesus talked about that. He, Jesus prophesied that that would happen. He wrote in Matthew, Matthew 26, where was that? Yeah. In Matthew 26, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, so this is, this is like the night before Christ died. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And so that, that, that verse there, I will strike the shepherd uh, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. You know, that's what happened when Christ died. This is also similar to what happened when Moses went up on the mountaintop. He went up and the sheep just kind of like had no <laughs> they had no shepherd guiding them all of a sudden, and they're just kind of going wild, going the way they want. Um, you know, I, I just think of so many stories with Jesus, you know, with the disciples. You know, how long must I bear with you? You know, you can picture Jesus saying that, because how many times the disciples just, they didn't catch the vision. Do you know when it was that the disciples finally did catch the vision? It was, huh? When the Holy Spirit came, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came inside them, all of a sudden these, these men who were you know, following Jesus for three and a half years, and they were always just kind of stumbling along, trying to figure it out as they go, all of a sudden, everything made sense. But we see the same thing with the children of Israel here. These were people not filled with the Holy Spirit. They had no clue where the Lord was taking them. They needed someone like Moses, a leader who could lead them. Um, so, so this just uh, further demonstrates, uh, uh, demonstrates another important aspect of leadership is presence. Yeah, presence. You know, I was thinking of, when I, when I thought of that, this applies to everybody, but I, I thought specifically of fathers. You know, I'm a father, and presence is a big deal. And sometimes we don't realize how big of a deal it is. But just being around for our kids, you know, being, being around, we are essentially a shepherd to our kids. 
And if, if they don't see our example, it could, it could be a disaster, really. In Proverbs 27, we know well, know well the conditions of your flock and give attention to your herds. I've, uh, I'm sure you've all, a lot of you have heard it, but I've heard uh, people say, a good shepherd smells like sheep, right? Like a good, someone who's a good shepherd is going to smell like sheep because they're around them, right? They're not, they're not at a distance. And so if you're wanting to lead people, you've got to be around them. So just to, to bring that all back, as leaders, whether it's, you know, parent, spouse, Sunday school teacher, whatever it is, we need to provide vision and, and be that shepherd to the people around us. Verse 2. This is verse 2 of, uh, of where we're at in the golden calf. Where is it? Okay, verse 2. Sorry. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, uh, in, in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Um, so Aaron shows that he is very pliable and unstable. Unstable. Another good uh, quality, and so this is to the antithesis of, of what uh, Aaron displayed is stability. Aaron was unstable. You know, when when these new ideas came to him, he crumbled under the pressure. And James, James mentions this, types of per, this type of person. In James 1, verse 6, we read, or 1, verse 5, I should say, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all, without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so we see here, Aaron was a doubter. I don't know what kind of doubt he had. It doesn't really say. But in some ways, he doubted. And he was like a wave in the sea, just driven wherever the winds take him, right? The waves come in. He just kind of goes that way. Hey, get up. Okay, he'll get up. Come, make us gods. Okay, I'll make you gods. And he made them gods. Another thing I picked up is how quickly has the tempted become the tempter, right? Aaron was tempted. And that wasn't the problem, right? There's always going to be a couple of dumb sheep with some dumb ideas, right? It's always going to happen. So these dumb sheep come up to Aaron and say, hey, we got this idea. We want some gods. Why don't you get up and come make them for us? It's at that point that Aaron has the choice of what to do. You know, I think of what Moses would have done in that situation. He would have put them to death immediately. There's no, no, uh, there's no room for that in, the, in Israel. But Aaron didn't have the same view. He entertained the thought. He went with it. He's like, yeah, maybe that would be a good idea. And so what does he do? Not only is he tempted, but then he becomes the tempter. He takes what a few people told him to do, and then he broadcasts it to the entire nation of Israel. And he says, this is what we're going to do. And all of a sudden, he puts this sin on everybody. The tempter becomes, the tempted becomes the tempter. Jesus speaks very harsh of tempters. In Luke 17, verse 1, And Jesus said to the disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Causing another one to sin is an egregious sin to the Lord. It's one thing, you know, to sin. We all sin from time to time, right? It's one thing to sin and then ask for forgiveness. It's another thing entirely to bring someone else into it, especially a weaker believer, or anyone for that matter. People will follow us whether we want them to or not. I, f- I found that out. Being a parent, I found that out. I, and I, I see that all the time. Like I, I don't think of myself as a, an influential person, but I, every once in a while I'll look behind me and realize, oh no, there are people following me. And you might find the same thing. There are people who follow w- whether you want them to or not. And so we need to always be on guard and always be 
um, you know, something to imitate. James, uh, uh, Paul said that. Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, that's a, a, a good mentality to have. I'm following Christ, follow me. And do the same thing I'm doing. So another good, good a quality of a leader is setting an example. Aaron obviously didn't do that. He was a tempter. He set a horrible example of what you shouldn't follow, but we need to be setting good examples of what to follow. Verse 4. See, we're moving through it slowly but surely. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who you brought up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast of the Lord. And it goes on. Um, Satan is not very clever or original. I don't know if you know that. He's not. He's been doing it since the beginning in the garden. He, he takes whatever God created to be good and he perverts it. That's a big kind of thing that Satan likes to do. Another thing he likes to do, and you see it really plain in this verse, he just likes to take credit for whatever God did. Because he's not original. And so we see, we see in here, they're saying, these are your gods, right? That, that led you out of Egypt. Yeah. Um, it was an amazing thing. I kind of already said it earlier. The amazing thing that God did, the, all the ten plagues, the, the parting the Red Sea, crossing on dry land, leading the, the children of Israel through the desert, giving them manna and quail, and uh, you know, leading them with a, a cloud by day and the fire by night. There's so much that God did in such a relatively short period of time. So many amazing things. And, and all of a sudden, Satan comes along to try to steal that. Like, oh, no. It was me all along. It was this golden calf. This cow over here, that's what did it. You know, worship is very important to God. You know, I, I didn't really put a lot of uh, scriptures in here about it, but it's, I mean, it's really important to God. Worship to him. And so you can think, you can only imagine how the opposite, worshiping the opposite of God, how, what that would do to him, what, how that would make him feel. Proverbs 14.28, it says, In a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without people, a prince is ruined. God, God desires many people to worship him, many people to bow down to him. And so, I think you, you can imagine if that's what he desires, then the opposite of that would be tremendously evil to him. And... Uh, and so I, I wonder, you know, in, in our life, you know, when we get gifts, when we get anything, are we giving the proper praise to God or are we praising something else? You know, for our job, for, I don't know, our possessions, anything that God's given us, anything that we have in our life, are we giving praise to God for it or are we giving praise to something else? You know, I... Um, in James 1.17, it says, Every good and, and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, right? Every good gift is from God. Are we giving him the praise for the things that we get, or are we praising something else or someone else? Should be praising God. Jesus talks about this. I don't have the scripture here, but the story of the ten lepers. You know, Jesus went to this, these lepers, and, and Israel, like, lepers, they were, like, in their own community. They, they couldn't come around other people. Uh, nobody could go around them. They were ostracized. This was a life-altering condition. If you had leprosy, it wasn't like you had poison ivy, you know? I'm like, oh, well, cool, my poison ivy's gone, you know? Jesus came and got rid of their leprosy. He changed their lives forever because of that. He comes, and he, and he says, ten... Ten people. He heals them. Ten people. And they all go away. And he said only one. And it happened to be a Samaritan. So it was a foreigner. Not even a Jew. One person comes back and thanks him for what he did. And Jesus kind of marveled at this. Like, what kind of unthankful people are you? You know? I did this amazing thing. It's not like I, like I said, it's not like poison ivy. I was like, okay, cool. That's cool. <laughs> no, this is life changing. And they didn't even feel the need to come back to him. You know, being thankful is very important to the Lord. And so we need to be 
people who are, who are thankful and giving praise and honor where, where he deserves it, not to a golden calf. Verse 7. I'm going to read 7 through 10 here. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. So another aspect of a great leader that I kind of pulled out of here, and you'll see where I'm going with this in a second, is being able to trust God with the unknown. Trusting God with the unknown. Moses was up on the mountain. He didn't know what was going on. He was up there for 40 days, which is actually a long time. You know, I say it's a short time earlier, but it really is a long time to be without a leader of a nation. And uh, he was up there for 40 days, and he had to trust that God was going to watch over them. You know, as a parent, you know, you can tell I'm, I'm relating this to being a parent because that's what's well, closest to me, right? As a parent, you know, I... I I can relate with the idea of not being in the same room as your kids and wondering what kind of mayhem they're up to. And uh, I don't probably worry about it as much as Christy because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for me. But, you know, me and Christy will just be talking in one room and she'll be like, hold, hold on. She's like, it's quiet. <laughs> She's like, it's, I'm like, yeah, it's always quiet. She's like, no, it's too quiet. And I'm like, no, that, there's no such thing. That's a good thing. It's supposed to be too quiet. She's like, no, this is a bad one. <laughs> so she goes into the other room. And I, it's like I'm, I'm counting down the seconds. I know it's coming. And all of a sudden I hear, what in the world is going on in here? She just knows. I had no clue. I thought everything was fine. She's like, what? Yeah, that's, that's the mommy sense she has. I don't have that. But you got to be able to trust. Because even with the mommy sense, there's so much you don't know. There's so much with your kids with the people who follow you, whatever it is, wherever you're at in life, there's so much that can happen when you're not around. You know, you think about like Kirk and his situation, you know, he preaches and he does stuff like on Sunday. He's got to trust that the other days you guys are still good, right? I don't worry about it. I, th I trust you guys. No. Moses, you know, he had to trust the Lord up there. I think Paul, um, where are we? Paul had the same kind of feelings, I think. Uh, yeah, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks about this. He says, for when, for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. And I, I, can, I can relate with that feeling. You know, I've had people in my, in my life that I've mentored, people that, you know, on shaky ground. And, and you know, when you're, you, let them, you let them alone, you're like, oh, man, I don't know if they're going to survive, you know? I just, I kind of wonder. They're kind of sh on shaky ground. I just don't know how they're going to do here. And I think that's a good attitude to have. But we also have to know when to, to give people up to the Lord and say, Lord, you take care of it. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure in this first Thessalonians example, it worked out in, in good favor, right? They ended up being fine. Move on to Exodus 32, verse 11. Is that right? Yeah. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out and kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning out anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven in all the land that I have promised. 
I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. You know, I, I love this part of it. Um, one thing that you see is the next aspect of great leadership. But actually, if you could go back to that verse, um, so you, several things you see. You see Moses, you know, he implored God. He, you know, he talked to him, why does your, your wrath burn hot? Why should the Egyptians, you know, say these things about, about Israel? And then he says, remember, he calls back to remembrance, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, I, I think it's awesome. You can go to the next slide again. I think it's awesome that Moses had this aspect. And I think it's another great aspect of leadership, which is a heart for restoration. It would have been really easy for Moses to just throw in the towel right here. Just kind of say, well, forget you guys. Just say, hey, it wasn't my fault. Just kill them all. Kill all those guys. But he didn't do that. Instead, Moses had that heart for restoration. He was like a captain of the ship, right? And he's willing to go down with the whole thing. He's like, well, I guess this is what it is. I'm willing to go down with it. And we'll see even later another verse that cements this in, which I think is one of the most amazing verses in the Bible, honestly. Um, but just like Moses, Jesus had the same heart of restoration. He took it to its extreme by dying on the cross for our sins, right? Jesus showed his heart for restoration in Matthew 18. He said, See... See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see my face and my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over ninety-nine that never went astray. So, it is with uh, not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He shows his, his heart. It shows Jesus' heart towards, um, towards his people. He wants restoration. He doesn't want to leave people uh, just to die. And, and Moses showed that thing. And I think it's a great quality of a leader, willing to go after people, not just giving up and saying, oh, good riddance, get out of here, but willing to go after people. Obviously, there is a point to let people go, but we still need to go after people to, to an extent. So how far are you willing to go to restore sheep? Whether it's whoever, people in the church, your own children, whatever. Move on to Exodus thirty-two fifteen. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets that were written on both sides, one on the front and, uh, and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua, see that's another leader that I'm not even talking about in this sermon, but you just see him kind of pop up his head here. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. So you might think at first, um, maybe, maybe this should be put in the bad category of leadership. He got angry and threw down his tablets just a bad look, maybe. I don't think so, though. I actually think quite the opposite. I think anger, not always, but anger really can be a sign of an invested leader. We don't read in Scripture to not be angry. You're not going to find that. In the, actually, the opposite. In Ephesians 4.26, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You know, I've, I've, always, you, I've always used this verse. Like, uh, me and Christy have always talked about it. We were like, oh, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Like, don't go to bed angry. And I think that's a fine way to use it. Like, it's, it's good to not go to bed angry. Yeah, that's fine. I don't necessarily think that's what it means, though. I really think what it means is when you're angry, deal with the anger. 
you, you know, use that anger and deal with it, deal with the problem before it turns into something else like malice or something like that. Use the anger for something good. And so here, I believe Moses is using his anger for good. Anger is a natural response, natural response to disobedience. It's also a motivating factor to help us deal with the disobedience. You know, when my, my kids disobey, it grieves me a lot. It grieves me a lot more than when your kids disobey. <laughs> right? Unless I'm at, like, the, the grocery store and, uh, you know, I hear a kid in the next aisle over and they're just, like, throwing a fit. And then I'm like, wow, someone's got to deal with this. But... Um, oh, you guys were supposed to react to that, and then I was going to have a funny joke. (laughs) Kind of ruined the punchline. Never mind. We'll move on. They don't all land, you know? Where was I? It seems to me that, you know, okay, so like like I said, you know, I don't, I care a lot more about when my kids disobey when your kids, than when your kids disobey. I kind of think Moses would, would feel the same way, right? If Moses came down from the the mountain, he saw like the Amorites or someone <laughs> worshiping a golden calf. He would have probably not liked it, but he would just like, forget those people, you know. They're going to die soon anyway. He wouldn't have cared so much. He cared because he loved his people, right? And so I care when my kids disobey, not because I hate them, quite the opposite. It's because I love them. I hate when my kids disobey. It grieves me to my core. So it seems to me that the ones who you love the most tend to make you the angriest. I, I, I've heard that before. Other people say that. It seems to ring true to me. In Hebrews 12, verse 5, and this is, uh, I think, the last verse I'm going to do. It says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you, ha- that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. See that? If he's, if he's disciplining us, that means we're sons. So if you're not being disciplined, what does that mean? Not sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live. So if Moses had not interceded for the children of Israel, he would have shown that he doesn't care. That's what he would have shown. Moses showed his love for Israel by being angry, by throwing down the tablets, by being furious at what he saw. See, our, our world says the opposite message. You ever notice that? Our world tries to conflate love with tolerance. That's a big one. If you love me, you'll just approve of whatever I do. You hear stuff like, just love me for who I am, right? That kind of concept. Just love me for who I am. This is the way I am. Just, just deal with it. Moses had a very different concept of love. And I think a godly concept of love. Jesus also said, um, if you love me, you will keep my commands, right? That's a prerequisite to loving him. You've got to obey his commands. So what is another good quality of leader? I I pulled out anger and discipline. I don't think anger is a bad thing. I think it's a motivating thing. Obviously, anger unbridled and taken to, (laughs) to, you know, if if you have anger and then you sin, that is bad. But anger in and of itself is not bad. It's a huge difference between Moses and Aaron. Moses knew that loving Israel meant discipline, restraint, and following the Lord, even when it hurts. And that's what we see from Moses throughout. Discipline, restraint, and following the Lord, even when it means all these burdensome laws. There's a lot of laws that they had to follow. And it was, it was difficult. Wouldn't it have been much easier not to follow those laws? Not to obey the Sabbath? Not to do all those things? It would have been much easier, but Moses followed those. Aaron thought that loving Israel meant tolerance, following passions and feelings, and putting off all restraint. You can see these attitudes play out on our national and even international scales. 
in, the, in, our, in our world today. Many are focusing on their feelings and want to be completely unmoored from Christ and his ways. Constantly we're bucking the truth of God's word and rather inserting will, uh, worldliness and chaos. Without God, man will always wonder and be looking... Um, sorry. <laughs> be looking for its next golden calf to be grounded. To be grounded, we need to be people of the word who will not bend to the cultural or spiritual winds around us. So I have a few more things to to finish out this chapter. If you go through it yourself, I I wasn't going to read the whole thing, but there's some great points that we can pull out from the rest of this scripture. So for Moses, we see that as a punishment for Israel's sin, you know what he did? He took the calf, he ground it down into a powder. And then he mixed it with water and made the Israelites drink it. He called it Powderade. <laughs> he, he said it was a profane shake. Get it? Like protein shake? No. Aaron, on the other hand... Aaron, on the other hand, deflected his responsibility and blamed the children of Israel for their evil hearts. Moses gathered the sons of Levi and had them kill about 3,000 men as punishment. He didn't take it lightly. Moses then took on their sin by going up to make atonement for them. And he was even willing to be blotted out of God's book because of their sin. That is the scripture I was talking about. I think it's one of the most amazing statements Moses is telling God, he's like, hey. And now this, you got to realize, this isn't Moses' personal sin. And he really could just pass the buck, say, hey, they, they did this without me. You saw it. But no, Moses said, hey, if you're going to blot them out, you might as well blot me out too, because I'm, I'm not leaving them. It's an amazing thing that he said there. But as for Aaron, he brought a plague on Israel because of the calf that he had made and broadcast that sin to the entire nation. So what kind of leader... Do you want to be? Do you want to be a Moses or do you want to be an Aaron? And ultimately, I hope the answer is actually that we want to be like Christ. Christ is the perfect fulfillment of a leader. If you, if you read all of Moses, <laughs> Moses wasn't a perfect leader. He had his faults too. In fact, he, I'm pretty sure he was, wasn't able to enter the promised land because of one of his errors. He wasn't perfect. But at least in this scripture, we see a clear example between Godly, liter- godly leadership and ungodly leadership. And, you know, if we apply these principles to our life and, and we realize the importance of being a leader in our lives, and like I said earlier, every one of you, if you're in Christ, you're a leader. Whether it's to one person or a hundred, you're a leader. And you need to take that responsibility and not take it lightly. You know, I try not to take this lightly. You know, I, I feel like um, you know, with, like with Aaron, you know, he wasn't just in charge of himself. He, he caused an entire nation to sin, right? So I shouldn't take something like this lightly. I, Kirk lets me get up here. I shouldn't take it light, lightly and just think, ah, I'll just shoot the breeze and say whatever I want. I want to take it very importantly and, and realize that whatever I say could have either a great outcome or a horrible outcome, one of the two. And the same thing with us, you know. The, the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. You know, we have influence over those around us. And so we need to take the, that mantle of responsibility that, you know, and realize, just like Moses did, hey, this is, I'm responsible for this nation and, and for the leadership. You know, if you're in Christ, you, you should have vision. You have the Holy Spirit who can give you that vision. And we can give that to other people. And so I just, I, I charge everyone here, you know, Take your, take your leadership, whatever it is, whether small or great, and use it to the best of your abilities. And I'm just going to pray now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word, Lord, that your word can, can speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and it can change our hearts, Lord, that we're not left without direction. Lord, there's a million books in this world that tell us a million different directions we can go. But there's this one book that gives us ultra clear direction. And Lord, if we can just, if we can just grab a hold of it and, and make that our focus in life, Lord Jesus, and, and, and to understand it through your Holy Spirit, 
Lord, our lives will mirror what you are calling us to. I pray with, the, with leadership that you would make us all leaders, leaders that will lead as Christ led. That we would not lead people into a pit, that we would not um, cause the little ones to stumble, as your, as your word says, but Lord Jesus, that we would provoke one another to love and good works. That we would make, uh, that we would cause each other to, to follow you, Lord Jesus, all of our days. Help us to be good leaders that follow your word. In Jesus' name, amen.